Hi, everyone. We're going to get started now uh, with the 12 to 1 lunch session. I'm Bill Rubenstein. I'm a professor here at the law school. Uh, I teach and write about complex litigation and class action lawsuits in particular. Uh, so I have um, witnessed and written about and thought quite a bit about the relationship of litigation funding to complex litigation in particular uh, in the United States and to litigation more generally. So I'm just really thrilled that there's a conference like this happening at the law school and I thank Robert whose idea it was. I think we should all thank Robert uh, with a nice round of applause. And I'm very honored to be a part of uh, this panel, although my role is going to be to recede into the background and let you learn from these three terrific people we have. Um, immediately to my left is Professor Tony Seabach, who's at Brooklyn Law School. Next to him is Tim Scranton, uh, and then Eric Blinderman. And what I'm going to do is start by asking each of our three panelists to just for a minute introduce themselves and talk about, in particular, their relationship to the idea of litigation funding. Um, the topic of our panel is actually the relationship between litigation funding and access to justice. Um, and we're going to layer in the access to justice piece after the introduction. So I just want everyone to get a sense of who's on the panel, how they got into the litigation funding world, and what exactly they do in that world. Tony, you want to start? Sure. So thank you very much for, uh, to the Harvard uh, Technology and Law Society for inviting me. Thank you, Bill, for being here. Uh, I am uh, a law professor who has been uh, interested in questions of uh, litigation and justice uh, uh, from a variety of perspectives, including mass torts cl um, and class actions, as well as politically motivated litigation uh, for uh, non-monetary ends, such as uh, restitution and slavery and restitution from the Holocaust. And I became interested in the idea of um, what I called a long time ago, venture capitalists for litigation. That is, why can't people who have no other interest other than making money uh, uh, invest in litigation the way that a venture capitalist might invest in a smart idea for an app? And I started working on that when I was at Brooklyn Law School. And uh, I continue working on that. Now I'm at Cardozo. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, I've written about this from many perspectives, um, both from a sort of philosophical perspective and also from a very technical perspective. I teach insurance law. And so one of the uh, things that I have been trying to ask people to do is to pull back at it from a 30,000 foot view of this question and ask the question, um, why do we treat insurance companies differently with regard to almost exactly the same rules that we're debating uh, than we treat third party funders? It's an interesting question. Um, and uh, I uh, also uh, consult. I've consulted for many litigation uh, uh, or legal finance companies, including probably one of my earliest consulting uh, opportunities was with Tim Scranton. It was really quite extraordinary. He and I go way back. Right now, uh, I consult for primarily uh, Burford Capital. Thank you, Tony. Tim? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I've been up here before, so um, I, maybe I can introduce myself a different way. Um, I'm, I'm here because my mother told me when I was a, a, a uh, young child that I was very disruptive um, and um, sort of fast forward to uh, 2006, 2005, um, I made uh, some investments in some very large um, um, international mass tort uh, claims against terrorist uh, governments and uh, saw <clears throat> in that that there was um, a very strange um, phenomenon in the United States. Uh, and that is that the only people that it seemed uh, who could um, fund litigation were lawyers. And so if you were a lawyer and you had a contingent fee opportunity and a claim, whatever it was, um, you could find money in going to a colleague who would, quote, co-counsel with you and they could provide the money. And I, I just didn't really understand that. Um, I was uh, in England uh, at the time in a project. I'm also an English barrister as well as a, an American lawyer. And they were passing legislation that I was speaking about in the last panel uh, that said it was OK to fund litigation. And I thought, well, why, why couldn't that work also in the, in the US? And uh, from there, I involved my other parent, <clears throat> um, who, my father, who's uh, now 65 years at the bar, um, I wrote a white paper on, on this uh, uh, prospect of 
funding large commercial claims. I, I sent it to Tony, I think, and Tony thought it was a good idea. And I sent it to my dad, and he didn't respond. And um, a couple of weeks later, I said, Dad, did you ever read the paper I sent you? He said, he said yeah, you, you can't do that. Um, and he said, if you do do it, you're probably going to get thrown in jail. Um, so that was, um, uh, that was um, sort of throwing down the gauntlet to me. And of course, what my father says I can't do, I went off and did. Uh, that was Juridica. Uh, in 2007. Since then, I have um, uh, been an investor. Uh, I have been an advisor uh, in this field. Um, I speak about it. I consult. And um, I've done a variety of things in a variety of ways. Um, so that's where I am now. Terrific. Eric? Uh, thanks so much, and thanks to everyone at Harvard for organizing the panel and for inviting me to speak. Um, in some ways, I guess my origin story, for lack of a better word, might be slightly make me an odd duck in that I'm a war crimes prosecutor by training, um, and I spent large portions of my career working for various acronyms in the United States government. And then when I separated from the U.S. government, I went uh, back to a large corporate law firm, Proscar Rose, where I had commenced my career, and in that capacity, Originally, when I first heard of litigation funding, I was with actually Selvin Seidel over at uh, a panel from the Oxford University Board of Trustees, and I was lecturing that with my sort of federal prosecutor hat on that the notion of monetizing a claim is champerness, maintenance, barratry, usury, whatever curse word you want to throw at the industry. And then from there, I began to represent, while at Proskauer, a series of litigation funders. Um, and particularly a certain group of people that sought to invest in litigation funding. And through there, my education began. And obviously, I've come full circle from uh, working as an advisor for people seeking to invest and then working to scale up some of my clients who, at the time, uh, I'm now Chief Executive Officer of Ethereum Capital Management's US operations. And at the time I began working with Ethereum, I think we had about 2 million pounds AUM and three guys in a room based out of London. Um, we began to scale up, look for institutional capital, walking into rooms and having people look at us like we were from Mars and we described the nature of the lack of correlation of the asset class and related and now Ethereum has over a billion AUM. We have just closed in our last fund to 430 million last week. Uh, we have offices in New York, Norway, London, Germany, Australia, Spain, Italy, and uh, it's my job to sit there and continue to grow and manage and run the U.S. operations. Terrific. Uh, what a great panel. So when I originally thought about moderating this panel, I had my own idea of what I wanted to hear. Uh, and it went like this. I wanted Eric, having been at Proskauer, to describe some commercial type case he might have been involved in where his client or he thought they needed litigation funding and give us a sense of how in practice you might get into situations where you would turn to a litigation funder. Uh, and then I wanted Tim as, uh, to act like a litigation funder and give us his reaction about whether he would fund the particular case that we were identifying. Uh, and then we had a phone call and I suggested this and everyone said to me, we're supposed to be talking about access to justice. Uh, and I said, oh yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. We have to connect everything that I just described to some notion of what, what do we mean by access of justice and when we talk about the relationship between litigation finance and access to justice, um, how are we thinking about that relationship? And I think we decided the place to start was to give a little bit of a definition of what we mean by access to justice when we're talking about it on this panel. So we're going to begin by Tony um, giving us some sense of what we're talking about when we talk about access to justice in this realm uh, and then go back through the exercise I talked about. Um, and I just want to say at the outset, our very real hope is that we'll leave a lot of time to involve those of you in the audience for some discussion after that. So, Tony, start by situating what we mean when we talk about access to justice. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I'm not quite sure that I agreed to talk about uh, what we talk about when we talk about access to justice. I definitely want to talk about what we talk about when we talk about legal finance, because I'm not quite sure that uh, legal finance is necessarily um, a efficient way to uh, obtain access to justice. What I do think it is, uh, is that it is a uh, way to uh, help the people uh, get access to a full valuation uh, of a, a properly adjudicated claim. And if that's justice, then so be it. 
Um, now, the people who want a full valuation of a properly adjudicated claim are otherwise known as plaintiffs. Um, uh, and uh, there are a variety of different people who have uh, claims. Uh, and the real world is that the uh, market that we're looking at uh, has, in America, uh, broken into two very distinct buckets. And I think it's important we use the real world when we talk about things today rather than maybe some ideal world or necessarily get confused and talk about other systems where the uh, uh, distribution of the markets might be uh, different, uh, although they're worth talking about from a comparative point of view. So in the United States, um, the two very different markets we're talking about are the consumer market and the commercial market. Uh, the consumer market is this market <coughs> of um, generally uh, small, meaning uh, maybe a couple thousand to usually no more than um, uh, tens of thousands uh, uh, advances. That is, the, the advances are small based on claims that could be high, uh, but often they're PI claims, so they're very hard to value. But the advances are small, a couple thousand to a few tens of thousands of advances uh, by s relatively small uh, what are called litigation funding companies with names like Oasis and Law Cash. And they're often based on a s relatively narrow set of claims involving personal injury. Uh, almost never medical malpractice. Very rarely you're going to see in Prox liability. We're talking really about what I teach in tort law, straightforward PI, the kind of stuff that is the meat and potatoes of PI work. Um, then there's the commercial market. And the commercial market, as we've talked probably about here today much more, and there we're talking about advances uh, that are in uh, hundreds of thousands, but often millions of dollars by litigation finance companies like uh, Bentham, Juridica, Burford. And uh, those are two uh, counterparties who are often general counsel uh, of companies who uh, are taking money uh, to be used for various purposes. Now, why are they doing this? And this is really what I want to focus on. So the consumers are usually doing it uh, in the context of having already, in fact, almost always, because there will be no underwriting by the litigation finance companies for consumer unless a lawyer has already signed on, and that lawyer has already signed on on a contingent basis. They're not financing the lawyering. The litigation funder is not financing the lawyering. The litigation funder is advancing money to the claim holder, and the claim holder is monetizing their claim for some purpose. Now, the first cut is they're monetizing that claim for some purpose so they can pay immediate costs. Um, I would argue that they're also monetizing uh, their claim for access to justice because if they can uh, lay off the risk of personal bankruptcy, if they can lay off the risk of being um, uh, evicted, if they can lay off the risk of having to face financial uh, squeezes, uh, they can resist lowball settlement offers. I teach insurance law. That's a technical term. It's what insurance companies offer people who have injuries, a lowball settlement offer. And it's what their uh, lawyer on the PI basis is saying, uh, geez, uh, well, I wish we would sell this case tomorrow. I also have to tell you, I think your case is worth more than they're offering. And so that's, in theory, what is being done with that monetization of the claim on the consumer side. On the commercial side, it's much more complicated. Um, probably many times on the commercial side, the impetus for going to a funder is in order to get some um, marginal gain in quality of lawyering. To go from the lawyering you can afford with your own in-house general counsel to going to a Proskauer. And improving on the margin, the chances of success, that might make the difference of actually even bringing a commercial claim, or uh, the chances of uh, maximizing the value of that claim. I wouldn't say that monetization for purposes of other projects, of laying off capital expenses, is too often the motivation. But you never know. I mean, it's hard to know what they're doing with that budget. If you get $3 million in uh, from the front end, that's $3 million you can use maybe to invest in a new factory somewhere. Um, so what's really happening here? What we're ha what's happening here is we're monetizing claims in order to uh, lower the cost of legal capital. There are lots of ways to lower the cost of legal capital, but in America, for a variety of reasons, which I've written about, uh, we've taken a number of them off the table. One of the ways to lower the cost of legal capital is let non-lawyers invest in law firms, but you can't do that in America. Uh, another way to lower the cost of legal capital um, would be uh, to uh, let people freely sell their claims to the people who are most able to bring those claims, but you can't do that very much in America either. So essentially, this is one of the few ways we have left to lower the cost of legal capital. And uh, that's why I think it actually does tend towards, at least in theory, promoting justice. If by justice you think justice is an accurate valuation of a claim 
that has been resolved either through litigation or arbitration. Now, uh, there are criticisms about uh, this practice, which I could go into. I'll just mention two of them. It's not my job to help the critics. Uh, but uh, the two obvious criticisms are, first of all, if you lower the cost of legal capital, you're taking a pipe and you're making the pipe bigger. And if you see litigation and the adjudication of claims as a sewage pipe, which a lot of people do, then you've got a bigger sewage pipe. I don't see it that way. I see the adjudication of claims that are not fraudulent, claims that are, in theory, um, genuine, but have not been brought because we have an expensive legal system. I see that big pipe as a good thing. But some people don't like the big pipe. They want to make the pipe smaller. Then there's the question of control. And I think control is a really important question. But I want to make sure we understand that in the United States, in, in technical terms, funders are not supposed to have control. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't imagine a third party who has control. Gee, who is that third party who can have control in America? Oh, liability insurers. They have control. Okay? Uh, so you can actually have a system where a third party has control over settlement. But that's just not the system we have. Now, would it be a bad thing to have third parties have control, more control than they have in the United States? That's a policy question. It is not, however, the question that I think we primarily need to argue about today if we're talking about the American system. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Tony. I just want to um, kind of reframe or restate or react to um, your two categories. Um, on the consumer side, I just want to emphasize um, the idea that Tony's putting out there is that um, people with personal injury claims um, would get an advance against their recovery of the personal injury claim. Um, and one idea Tony suggests is that it's possible that that advance the small amount of money, relatively small amount of money they would get, would enable them to stick to the litigation and hence enhance the possibility that we get a more accurate outcome of the litigation and, and some greater justice uh, in that regard. Um, I just want to kind of repeat that idea. I think it's an important idea. Tony's done some amazing work attempting empirically to investigate whether it's actually accurate. Um, and it's a very complicated thing to uh, interrogate so we don't, or to follow up on empirically, so we don't actually know if that happened, but that's the idea that would connect it to a justice theme. I wanted to reiterate that in part because I think the rest of the panel is not really going to talk about that. Um, our panelists are more on the commercial side, uh, so I just want to make sure we have that paradigm Tony put out, because uh, I do think it's an important one when we're talking about access to justice and litigation financing. Now to flip over to the commercial side, um, Eric, I wanted to again start with you. Um, and really go back a little bit to your days in practice to get started, although you're a funder, so we'll want to get your expertise there as well. Tony suggests the following, that on the commercial side, you may have clients, and the ability to help fund the lawsuit may give them access to better lawyers or something else. Why don't you take it from there and tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and I, I think this notion of access to justice is not only limited to my time at Proskauer when I was in the unenviable position of seeking to obtain litigation funding on behalf of several clients. And at the time, the litigation finance industry was much, much smaller than it is today. So our options were limited to you know, probably three, maybe four entities um, who were then in existence, some of which are no longer in existence, some of which have grown. What about today? Uh, you said there were three or four. How many <laughs> today there's much more. I think the industry has grown. I think latest um, statistics have you know, five to seven billion, at least in capital deployable, potentially many magnitude, orders of magnitude more if you're gonna count some of the hedge funds on top of sort of you know, the, 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 the publicly facing litigation funding entities that people are aware of. Um, so that's an important distinction at the time. You know, I was sitting at my desk at Proskauer, and to sort of give an example, I was representing a plaintiff, actually, for many years, who had what we thought were, were very strong claims involving, and I'm going to speak sort of somewhat obliquely, but uh, energy assets in an emerging part of the world, and those energy assets were stolen from him. And of course, the immediate reaction is, how does someone steal an oil well or a coal mine? Well, it's really simple. You walk in with a bunch of AK-47s, you point it at my client's head, and you say you're going to sign these documents and you're going to disappear from the country. And then the courts in various parts of the world will sit there and bless those documents. And the people that did that, there was jurisdictional issues to be fought, but we felt that these claims could be brought in the United States. Of course, the client's primary assets were these, the 
primary assets that the client had to pay Proskauer's politely. They weren't exorbitant legal fees. I think Proskauer is, a, is perfectly value add and the legal acumen that Proskauer brings to the table is not marginal. We, we win cases, we try cases as the former chairman of the litigation department might say. But the client began to experience uh, what we characterized at Proskauer as fee fatigue. And that's really just a fancy way of saying all of his money had disappeared and he no longer could pay Proskauer's bills. Again, you know, he had certain money from his assets and no longer those cash flows were, were coming in. And so we were faced with a real dilemma. You develop a relationship. We had been working with this client for years. We had successfully taken over the case from a, another uh, solo practitioner that didn't have very good results. We actually took the case up to the Second Circuit. We had, the case was originally dismissed in the Southern District. We had gotten it reversed on forum non-grounds. And uh, you know, that was a big deal because the discretionary aspect of the standard to overturn that finding of uh, forum non was significant. And you don't want to leave your client hanging out to dry. And more importantly, you don't want to turn your client over to some place where that incremental order of magnitude of which the lawyering makes the difference would result in a negative outcome for the client as the case was now proceeding forward. So myself and my partner sat down and we sort of scratched our head and we said, okay, this thing called litigation funding, how does it work? I knew nothing about it. Um, I don't even think I'd gone to that conference yet that I'd referenced earlier where I was you know, speaking against litigation funding as the most awful thing in the world. But I did recognize that I wanted to win this case for my client. I wanted to ensure that my client had the financial resources to carry the case through to conclusion. And so I started calling. At the time, Parabellum was then called Credit Suisse. Juridica was in existence. Uh, I, Burford, I think, was still you know, young but, but functioning at that point. And I literally just started cold calling people and said, hey, I'm Eric Wunderman from Proskauer. We've got a case. The client has fee fatigue, um, can't pay the bills. Proskauer, like many AMLAW 200 law firms are above, we don't generally take cases on contingency fee. Obviously, there's a well-developed contingency fee bar in the United States, but even then, the resources of many contingency fee law firms, it's changed now slightly with Boys, Quinn Emanuel, and other law firms that are now more resourced to sit there and take large complex litigations all the way to conclusion with the discovery fights and related. But at the time, it was a, a, a real important point for us that the client had the, the heft that a large corporate law firm could sit there and take to you know, bat against, on the other side, what were really just every other major law firm from you know, Sullivan and Cromwell and sort of you know, just up and, down the, up and down Wall Street. And during the course of those discussions, lots of questions were asked, due diligence was conducted. I, other than answering substance, would pass the um, funder's economic inquiries off to the client. I felt like it was my job to facilitate, but not to control. It was my job to sit there and ensure that to the extent that I could provide reasoned and sound advice for the client, that it was my job to do so. I also advised the client that to the extent that he was entering into a funding agreement, that he needed to get outside counsel, uh, which he did do. I can, uh, just a side digression in my capacity as a funder, we always advise when we enter into a commercial transaction with any litigant for any single one-off case that they get outside counsel. You will find in practice that most of the times they do not, that they're comfortable waiving whatever potential conflicts they have with respect to their attorneys, you know, negotiating with a litigation funder for the attorney to sit there and then have a means for or a, a funding source to pay their bills. Um, and the financing was very expensive. It took a lot of time for me to sit there and get to, you know, the point where the funders were comfortable funding the case and eventually the case was funded and we were able to prosecute the matter moving forward and and that you know is sort of one of many war stories I could tell I you know I see you leaning over in time I will I will cabin myself there 30 second follow up sure <clears throat> tony mentions control yep in the case you just described your client gets the litigation funder yep you never have any connection or talk to or receive any command from the litigation funder uh, so no, and I, I describe this now, I'm a member of the Rule 26 Advisory Committee, so I travel around lecturing to judges, and we were just in Texas literally yesterday, I got off a plane, and I, what I describe is big C control versus little C control. 
And big C control is the notion, like insurance companies will come in and say, this law firm, I'm going to direct every aspect of the litigation. I'm going to sit there and what, you know, the settlement offer will be accepted or rejected and all of the things that we're contractually prohibited from doing in the United States to avoid all the ethical prohibitions attached to all the former curse words that I just sort of rambled on before. Little C control is different. So when I was at Prosco, I would certainly provide updates to the litigation funding firm. They were interested to know what was transpiring. But I have to say, other than the capital being expensive and wanting to ensure that there was a positive outcome, they let me do what it is that I needed to do, which was to prosecute the case. I'd like to think that Ethereum does the same. I will tell you in my capacity as a funder, a relationship develops. You know, our cost of capital is built into our funding agreement. We don't bill by the hour. So it is not uncommon collectively across Ethereum. We all come from commercial litigation backgrounds. So the lawyers will often come to us and say, there's a strategic inflection point. I was just curious to get your views on the matter. And we're happy to provide that. I'd like to think, you know, people can disagree that we're smart money. In other words, that we are providing incremental value add and a separate set of sounding boards that really, when we underwrite, we're happy to take a case all the way to conclusion. And if it goes that way, that's fine. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. And it's important that you work, from my perspective, with a funder that really takes a sort of quasi hands-off approach. Good, we're gonna bring Tim in a minute, but Tony has a 30 second reaction to what you just said. I mean, I know Eric wants to talk about uh, legal ethics at some point. And I think that it's just worth uh, just pointing out that with small C control uh, and with old fashioned game theory, uh, if you have a, uh, a firm that uh, has a re repeat player relationship with a funder, um, it may be the case that uh, all you need is a phone call and a conversation for the funder to have its opinion uh, altered and shaded in what kind of uh, advice it's going to give the client with regard to critical questions of settlement. And I'm not quite sure how you can write rules against that. So I, yeah, I'm happy to react. I can tell you in practice, this is sort of the problem because there is in some cases or really most cases an opaqueness as to how the litigation funding industry operates and in practice i'm on these settlement calls not infrequently and i can just tell you from a personal perspective and obviously that's specious reasoning i literally was just on one of those calls yesterday in the lobby of the hotel where i'm saying and i made it a point to literally tell the client at the outset whatever you decide we have no stake at the table we have underwritten this all the way to the end of conclusion and you need to accept whatever settlement you think will make you happy. I'm sure other funders have different views on that, but um, I'm not quite sure how you underwrite that as well or get around or regulate or, or put in a rule. It's, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's gonna behave differently. And yeah. Eric, fine. in your, the example you gave, did we get closer to Tony's idea of what justice we're defining as, meaning that the client was able to get closer to a good result? From my perspective, strongly yes, Good. strongly, Good. Um, you, yeah. Tim, Eric gave an example of a case, brings you the case, how do you think about whether you want to fund it or not? That's, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to take Eric through the due diligence that he described he suffered um, what does that consist of? Maybe I'll circle back to that and more directly answer the question. I'm going to look at the case to figure out whether the outcome of the case is going to be enforceable, meaning if I took the first $5 and it settled for $5, I might have a litigation on my hands. Uh, so I've got to make sure that the case has enough uh, you know, it's chunky enough to have a place at the table for, for funding. Um, in other words, I'm going to look at the metrics of recovery, you know, the ratios, how much does it cost um, to pay Eric? Um, what's the client really going to settle for? Another conversation that I would obviously have is I would want to know what the, what the client expects. I mean, if the client says, you know, I, I really, you know, I'm in this just to you know, punish my ex-partner, he did me wrong, uh, money's not important, um, I'm not gonna take the case, right? So I wanna make sure that this is, that the dispute is about money, is about sufficient money, that there's room in the capital stack, so to speak, to accommodate a funder at the level that will uh, accommodate Eric's needs. Um, 
and that I might call the financial underwriting or due diligence of the case. Um, and that's really a threshold issue. I'm gonna look at that first and say, you know, is there enough money involved here uh, in, 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 you know, in some shape that, that I can even participate? Um, then I'm gonna say, all right, what about the merits, right? Um, are they uh, as good as Eric says? Um, this is Eric in his, uh, in, in his past life where he wanted to sell uh, his claim, forgive me to use that word, dirty word, but he wanted to sell or promote his claim, uh, perhaps to me, and, uh, and I can see through that because um, I, I'm giving you my jaundice perspective. Uh, I know that, that Eric um, is in love with his case, he likes his client, he thinks he's going to win, um, and so I've got to be able to um, stress test uh, his view uh, his analysis, uh, and, and hopefully, um, you know, get to the bottom of whether he's really going to win or not, right? And that's, that's not always an easy thing to do. Uh, why? I mean, think of it this way. Um, litigation investors come in along any stage uh, of the process uh, of litigation. I think the example uh, Eric used was uh, a sort of later stage fee fatigue uh, sort of uh, situation. At that point, presumably, there was decent visibility on not only what the claims were and the supporting evidence, but also what the defenses were. But if you're looking at a claim that has not yet been filed, you don't know what the defenses will be, you know what the defenses should be. But do you have visibility into defensive evidence? No. Uh, so depending on what stage the claim is, uh, has reached, uh, you'll have more or less visibility into the likely, uh, likelihood of success on the merits. Uh, so I would look at the merits. Um, I'm also going to look at, at other things, call it mm, uh, social factors. Uh, do, do I believe Eric? Uh, do I like Eric? Uh, does Eric have a track record? Is Proskauer a decent firm? Um, uh, who, who is this claim holder? Um, when he says he, he, he's not in it for uh, for blood, he's in it for money, do I really believe him? When he says he's gonna settle for nothing short of $50 million, uh, do I believe him? Because mind you, if he settles for $5 million, uh, then he creates a problem for me. And uh, if I have no control over him, uh, and, and precisely don't have any control over how he might behave in two years when he's been in litigation for two years and maybe stressed and so forth, um, how am I really gonna know what he's gonna do? Right? So, so, um, so I look at what I call counterparty risk. Um, then I, if, if I get through those um, uh, sort of threshold underwriting uh, uh, stages, uh, looking at uh, damages, looking at the um, you know, potential to make money in the claim, looking at the merits, looking at the counterparty risk and a host of other risks. If you heard our last panel, uh, there was discussion about you know, in international arbitration, Often the, the issue, the big issue in the, in the case lies uh, not at merits, um, uh, but rather, and not at damages, but rather at collection, right? So in a cross-border dispute, a lot of times, the first thing I look at is collection risk, right? I, I, I will turn the entire analysis upside down to be efficient, because you have to be efficient. Um, a quick statistic, I, th I think I've, uh, I lost count a couple of years ago, but I think I've looked at sort of a thousand cases uh, large commercial cases for investment. Uh, in, in some of those instances, I listened to you know five minutes in a phone call and decided it wasn't for me. In other uh, instances, I spent uh, you know months um, you know looking at documents. But I've looked at a lot uh, of cases, and if if you're going to engage in that kind of enterprise, which avoids adver adverse selection um, and and promotes you know a reasonable variety of cases you can look at. Um, you're going to be, um, you know, at some kind of ratio, uh, looking at uh, five to take one, looking at ten to take one. Um, you know, for those who now do banner ads on Google, uh, they're looking at uh, 30 uh, to take one or 40 to take one. How, how, how do you do this? You know, how do you do it reasonably? Because these are big, complex litigations. Uh, so the last thing I would do um, in this process uh, is I would try to structure a deal that would probably keep me happy, 
no, no matter what were to happen along the way. So what, what could happen? Well, Eric was wrong in his budget. He really needs more money than he thought he needed. Uh, the client uh, is going to settle for less than he thought he would. Uh, the, the case goes um, three years longer because of some interlocutory appeals. Uh, this is all about amount invested, amount of return, and time to return, okay? Uh, and I would submit to you, uh, even the uh, seasoned lawyers in the audience, um, to, to do this business, to participate in this business, you really have to unlearn the whole notion of time and litigation because we're, we're taught in the billable hour uh, framework uh, that the longer it takes, the more you'll make. Well, that is not so, of course, in, in our profession. Um, so our profession meaning the litigation finance profession. Uh, so I would try to structure a deal uh, that, that protects me. I might put some things in there going to this control uh, notion like, well, uh, if the client wants to settle for uh, some lower amount, maybe I've got an opportunity to buy his interest out or pay him some money so he stays in the game. I mean, these are things that, that uh, are contractual uh, control mechanisms, collars, or whatever that are put inside the transaction documents. Um, you know, maybe I structure something that works, maybe I, maybe I don't. And at the end of it, with, um, with a lot of luck, uh, maybe I'm going to win some money. Beautiful. So let me ask Tim one follow-up question of you real quick, and then one follow-up question I'm going to ask everyone to talk for a minute, and then we're going to kind of open it up and see if folks have questions and other things they want to discuss. Um, Tim, the simple follow-up question for you is this. One of the ideas that's come across, um, several people have said, is there's a lot more competition than, it used, than there used to be. So I wanted to layer in, while you're thinking about whether to take a case, you know that Eric has now pitched the case to five other funders as well. Um, one might think that that could lead you to shade your decision of whether to take the case in favor of taking a case you might not otherwise take, because there's you want to grab it before someone else gets it, and it might cut down on your diligence or other decision making. The second thing, uh, kind of, we began by saying the reason this is connected to access to justice is that the funding helps get the case closer to an accurate result from the plaintiff's perspective. I noticed that in your overview of the things that you discussed, that wasn't one of them. So I guess I'd conclude the connection by saying the following. As long as the funders follow their own self-interest, perhaps there's an alignment of interests that if you're following your self-interest of making profit, we could hit Tony's definition of getting access to justice um, and maybe have each of you talk for a second yeah, about that's that. Yeah, that's a very optimistic view. <laughs> um, and, and, but, you know, I, I do think that there are uh, symmetries. There, there are a lot of symmetries out there. Um, I mean, I'm going to go off the subject perhaps slightly. In, in this field, um, my colleagues that have been in it um, know that we share all kinds of ru rules of thumb, um, shorthand expressions. Um, among my colleagues, I'll refer to a DVG. Uh, that's a David versus Goliath case. Um, generally, I, I like DVG. I mean, my, you know, I, I, I like uh, little guys uh, being uh, fueled up to go against big guys, particularly where they couldn't other, otherwise avoid it. Um, I also like uh, sort of what I call found money cases, uh, cases where uh, large corporations are recovering things that, um, that they didn't know they even had a right to and probably would have forgotten about if some, somebody hadn't reminded them. Good, good example are the civil actions that follow price-fixing cases. Uh, they're great because you, uh, you have a prosecution, uh, their liability is established, and then what the civil case is about is how much was the price fix and how much did you lose? I love those cases. Um, uh, so there are a lot of, you know, um, access to justice definitely weaves in and alongside the trajectory of lit litigation finance. It doesn't motivate it, uh, but I'll give you an example of where it does motivate it, uh, an area that I have a lot of passion about. I've done a fair amount of work in this over the last five years is uh, social justice. Um, I'm finding that uh, philanthropy, charities, foundations uh, are, are realizing more and more that litigation is a very powerful tool to bring about their core missions. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of felt swarmy 
uh, if you will, uh, 10 years ago, but with the uh, uh, now increasing acceptance of litigation funding, uh, uh, charities are realizing that that's a, a very useful way to, for them to spend money. And so I've structured a number of investments in, in uh, litigations by, uh, by charities. And that, that is, um, I mean, is that access to justice, um, or is it promotion, promoting social good, or is it a little both, hard to say. But you can't, I, I will say this, you cannot uh, make any snap judgments about what this industry is about, because it's got a lot of features, a lot of faces, it does a lot of different things, uh, but ultimately it can only be in business if it's making money. Eric, <coughs> Eric if you're making money, are you sure. getting closer to Tony's goal or not? Uh, I think so, and I'd like to just revert back to your earlier, your first point, which was to the extent that competition may cause us to reduce the discipline or otherwise attaching to our diligence process, and I think it's important to remember, and we'll tie it to your profit point, all of the litigation funders um, who are in business produce three letters, and that's IRR, and that's IRR for their investors. And so in order to do that, we need to find the right investments, and those need to sit there and underpin and hit all of the points that Tim raised from an underwriting perspective, you know, I sort of distill them down to what I call sort of the four pillars, the first of which is likelihood of success on the merits. That means you're not funding, pardon my French, crappy claims. And the moment you start funding crappy claims and you start reducing the discipline that attaches to your diligence approach, you lose and you will be out of business. And I've seen lots of funders relax that discipline and make investments that shouldn't otherwise be made, whether it's because someone is coming from a competition perspective or there's pressure to deploy capital. One of my CEOs of another fund and I were having lunch the other day and rightfully said that the moment that any CEO feels the pressure to deploy capital, that fund is gonna be in trouble. And I tell all of my investment officers, all of them, I am not in the business of deploying capital. Ethereum is not. Anyone can deploy capital. We're in the process of funding meritorious claims that will resolve within a three to five year time horizon and sit there and result in the target returns that we want. And in so doing, those claims probably would not have been brought but for our capital. And that promotes access to justice, and that's important. In, in that very last phrase, you say that to your investment officers? It's interesting you point that out. Philosophically, Ethereum, it's embedded in our DNA and we've just launched Ethereum Access which not only is um, you know, relevant to whatever you know, I've just talked about earlier, but it's a pro bono fund that funds uh, social justice litigation for no return based upon our assets under management, and it could be whether it's climate change litigation or other social impact for no monetary return. And that's important um, because we still are outside of the profession, yet part of the profession, and access to justice remains core to what we do. Great. Tony, last thing, and we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I misspoke when I, I, I whispered an aside to you. The, what I meant to say is, you know, you just captured the, the, the concept of the winner's curse, right? Which is that um, if uh, uh, you win the auction uh, for a case because uh, the person who's selling it to you uh, is giving you the largest proportion of the recovery, uh, there's a good chance that you just bought a, a lemon, mm -hmm. right? This is the lemon's problem. Yeah. And so uh, what we hope is that... Um, the market is actually going to somehow be able to resist the lemons problem, and that's why we hope uh, that, in fact, uh, a competition for um, uh, price is actually going to generate uh, the best estimate for the most accurate pricing of the value of cases. Now, the reason why, uh, of course, that's all just theory, right, is two things. First of all, um, we know uh, that um, from a class action perspective, uh, there isn't always, in fact, correlation between uh, firms that in the class action context successfully get class action representation and actually do justice for their clients. And we know why. It's because there is other interests that those lawyers have. And this could be the same problem with funders. Funders could have those same interests. But I actually here see a slightly uh, cleaner model because I actually think that the only thing that the funders are interested in doing is getting the highest and best use of their capital. And the highest and best use of their capital is going to be the strongest and most um, meritorious claims. Now, that's one, one quick answer. The second quick answer, though, is to cut against what I've said, which is to say that uh, there's other definitions of access to justice which are very, very hard to correlate to um, highest and best use of capital. So, for example, uh, I don't know if we've talked about this yesterday or today here, but uh, the poster child of why people are concerned about the relationship between third-party fi financing of litigation and um, access to justice is 
the Gawker case. You know, the Gawker case was a case in which a very wealthy person um, secretly, although probably in a perfect world wouldn't have to secretly fund litigation against a media company because that very wealthy person had a political, let's say a political beef with that media company. And they weren't interested in making money. They, they explicitly, in fact, did everything they could to keep the litigation going in the face of choices that uh, could have been taken to actually re produce a positive return. They actually instructed the person they were funding to um, drop claims that would be covered by insurance so that uh, it would be the case would keep going and, and result in nothing, right? Now the question is, do we consider that to be access to justice or not when you have people who are motivated by non-monetary concerns funding litigation? And I don't know what the answer to that is either because this actually takes us back to um, uh, in Ray Primus and in the Boise versus Button where that's exactly what civil rights groups did. Right, that's a great point. Um, let's open it up and see if there are questions, comments from the uh, audience. Um, I have a comment or question of, of Eric. Uh, I remember distinctly working with you as a when you were a lawyer at Proskauer and being impressed at the time with how skilled and honest and thorough you were, how do you find your switching now to the funder side? Ethereum is obviously doing extremely well. You've only been there a short time, but um, how do you view your role now as uh, a funder versus the lawyer, and how much do you count on your lawyers? Sure, um, thank you for the compliments, I appreciate that. My mom would be pleased, I have low enough self-esteem that I'll take that. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I think the same things we experienced when we were looking at cases, I've been working with them really for close to eight years, nine years, and they've only been in business for 10, and working with funders while at Proskauer, in essence, learning the trade, not just seeking litigation funding, but I was underwriting and diligencing cl claims for people like Salvin, for people like Ethereum. And in my role at Ethereum, it's taking the lessons that I learned. So, for example, I remember when I was seeking funding and sort of selling the claim, it's not really what I was doing, but I understand the time suck that came while I was a practicing lawyer, responding to questions that I just sort of scratched my head and said, didn't they read the complaint? And clearly they hadn't read the complaint. So I always sort of tell all of my investment officers to please do the diligence, please roll up the sleeves, please do the work. You know, we're working with these lawyers. This is not the only claim that they're funding, and please be judicious. We need to overcome basic notions of information asymmetry, which is the lawyer will inevitably know more about the claim than we do. It's just by definition. But by the same token, you can be judicious with your time, but it also means take a look at the secondary resources if needed. Take a look at, you know, not just the underlying judicial opinions, do the legal research. It means if you're gonna sit there and get a document dump of relevant data pieces that are gonna be relevant towards you know, making an investment decision, do that. The problem is triage. The problem is the volume. The problem is we are just inundated with such a demand for our services that keeping up is, it's resulted in Ethereum basically using a funnel approach where we have certain metrics that we use. Are we on mandate? Are we off mandate? We have certain economic rules of thumb that we use, certain case types that we're more inclined to use besides law school. I made the mistake of going to Columbia Business School and being in the value investing program. So Warren Buffett, Benjamin Graham, Phil Fisher, you know, invest in what you know, factor in your growth expectation. You can do a discounted cash flow analysis. You can model the claims and put a present day value on them now taking into account the anticipated litigation risk. All of that goes into 24 hours in a day and how do you sit there and get through um, making sure you've got trained, skilled people, one of whom you met yesterday, Elizabeth Korchin, to really stick to the fundamentals. You digress from the fundamentals, you'll get into trouble. 
Any questions? Isabel? Uh, thanks so much for that discussion. So we're at law school, so technically you can argue both sides for, for anything. Um, so my question to you is, do you envision uh, a place where the education finance industry will ultimately uh, come to a more standardized um, regulation or definition of access to justice? Because I think currently, um, <coughs> You know, as a legal tech, I talk to a lot of the, uh, litigation funders. I kind of have a gossip of like who has integrity, who does not, who has you know who's shark here and who's not. Um, oh, but that's kind of the, the the characteristic of an industry that's like so new and you know still in the infant stage. But ultimately, as it evolves, do you feel that the definition of what it means to be you know to truly provide access to justice will become a more standardized approach? And you know, I'm particularly curious. Um, for the professor's uh, point of view? It's a great question. And Isabel, if it's okay with you, can I make a friendly amendment to the question as well? Because <laughs> Eric mentioned just now, um, you're inundated with requests for funding. And Tim, I assume you must be in the same. So um, I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit, been a little bit naive about this. I'm aware that a lot of capital is going into this, but it hadn't dawned on me it's going there because there's such a demand for the capital. Um, so I think Isabel raises a great question. Your industry is growing, um, and is it good that it's growing? And are there is that going to be the growth of some bad funders as well as good funders? And will the market sort it all out? And how do we think about where where we're going with it? It's a wonderful question. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let everyone have a crack at it in the last five minutes. Happy to defer. Jim, you want to start? Sure. Um, if you, if you uh, read back in history, uh, 2008, 2009, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Institute for Legal Reform uh, came out with extensive position papers making arguments that, uh, that this industry was bad and it should be stopped, full stop. Um, and, um, you know, we in the industry had to deal with that. Uh, had to develop some rational explanations why they were wrong, um, and the debate eventually died down. So if you try to find that debate today, it's, it's gone. It's historical. You need to read back in time. Um, you know, the arguments were you're going to find, you're going to fund frivolous claims. Uh, there's going to be more litigation, as, as Tony described in his sewage pipe. Um, you know, you're going to see phenomena that are, that are wrong. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's a debate, I, if you, I commend to you, go back and read a RAND report from 2010 on alternative litigation finance. It examined some of these issues from an economic standpoint, concluded that there's nothing wrong with it uh, that we see from an economic standpoint. Um, but, but I will say this, um, the world has to be patient about this market. Uh, it's still uh, relatively embryonic. Um, you know, even 10, 12 years on, um, there, there, there are problems that it's experiencing. Uh, I'm, I'm quickly going to answer a question you asked 10 minutes ago. Um, what do you do when you, you're asked to look at a case and you know five other people are looking at it? Um, because looking at a large, you know, a complex antitrust case, I mean, you can't do that in five minutes. Um, so one, I think it's a, a problem that needs correction in the industry is there, there is a, uh, a lack of shopping among funders. Why? Because if a funder's gonna sink their teeth into a case to really diligence it to the level they need to to even understand it, they're gonna get the case under exclusivity. They're gonna get the claim holder, the lawyer, or both, to sign something that says, okay, for a period of time, I won't go anywhere else. And that means that um, there is not really a shopping market. You cannot really do that. You can do it at a threshold level, but once you engage, uh, th then the music sort of stops and you're sort of stuck with that funder until their exclusivity expires. And that means there are no auctions. There are no auctions, really. Um, and, uh, and, and pricing is, is, uh, uh, is not in a competitive state, okay? And so, you know, as this little industry grows, these things will be corrected, but, but right now they, they, they are issues. Um, in the end, um, 
is it providing access to justice? The answer is, on a global level, clearly so. I mean, as you heard me last panel, in England, contingent fees were illegal until two years ago, um, or three years ago. Uh, they had no access to justice. There are lots of places in the world where without funding, you, you have no access to the justice system at all. Uh, so, you know, is it really true in the U.S.? We tend to be a little myopic in our views. We've had contingent fees for 200 years. Do we have a, an access to justice problem? No. Does funding help in, or improve that? Mm, possibly. But I think if you look at the phenomenon globally, it's, the proof is there. We have two minutes left. Um, Eric, you're yielding your time. Tony, so, you uh, wrap I, us up. Well, I just want to say that I think that your question suggest, it can be broken into two different kinds of questions of justice. Um, clearly, there's a question of whether or not uh, this capital and, and making this capital cheaper is going to bring uh, more claims that will more accurately identify and then provide recourse for injuries that otherwise would have been left uncompensated. And I can say that right now, uh, I think it's highly unlikely that uh, when it comes to consumer litigation finance, um, that there's any evidence at all that the industry is um, providing an incentive for people to bring claims that wouldn't have already have been brought. Um, is it creating a more accurate price for settlement value? I just don't know. So then there's a second justice question which people are asking, which is, um, if we don't ask that question, if we ask a different question, which is, is um, a, um, uh, a valid claim against another person um, a property interest? Yeah, I think it is, by the way. Um, if it's a property interest, should uh, people who otherwise don't have a lot of property, they might be people who rent, they might be people who are just working on hourly wages, they don't have a lot of property. Maybe because of a terrible, terrible, terrible thing happened in their life, they got a piece of property now, which is worth something to them, a $30,000 PI claim. Um, should they be allowed to uh, alienate it or sell it or do what they want with it because it's property, okay? Now, I think they should be. But then the question is, should we protect them so that like with other forms of consumer protection, they don't get ripped off? And that's the other side. That's the other justice question. If we have this market in this property interest, how do we protect people? And I have some ideas about that. But that certainly shutting the market down in a paternalistic way, saying you can't sell this piece of property, that's not for you. Only companies can sell their lawsuits, but not people. To me, that's just weird. <laughs> what a terrific ending. Uh, that's the beginning of the next uh, conference we'll have. Uh, can you just go ahead and uh, alienate your legal rights and sell them? Um, I want to thank you all. This has been uh, terrific and, for me, terrifically uh, informative and enlightening. And we really appreciate everyone coming here and joining us. So for the panelists, let's thank you all.